We told you Monday about a U.S. deal to sell nuclear-powered attack submarines to Australia. President Biden met with the prime ministers of Australia and the U.K. to announce the deal. Keep an eye on your news feed in about a decade for the results. That's when Australia will buy at least three nuclear subs. The move, though, is much more than a business deal. It's seen as a direct response to China's growing influence in the Indo-Pacific region. Taiwan is also addressing China's influence and threats. It unveiled new types of military drones Tuesday to boost its ability to take on the Chinese military. China considers Taiwan part of its territory and has threatened to take it by force. President Biden has said that the U.S., would defend Taiwan if China invaded the island. For more on this, our friend and editor-in-chief of The Economist, Zanny Mittenbedos, is here with me. Zanny, it's good to see you again. The cover of the latest Economist reads, The Struggle for Taiwan, and it calls it The New Cold War's Flashpoint. Lay out the questions and stakes around this new flashpoint. Well, it's very nice to join you again. Thank you for having me. Um, the stakes are incredibly high. We, a couple of years ago, put the a picture of the Taiwan Straits on the cover, and we called it the most dangerous place on Earth. And it was true then, and I think it's even more true now. And what we lay out this week in a special report on Taiwan, which is a long, in-depth look at the country, is just how prepared Taiwan is. And we have a briefing which looks at what a war between the U.S. and China might look like. And frankly, it's, it's, it's deeply, deeply alarming. When I first read it, I thought, my goodness. And, and the kind of logic, the reason this is such a worrying part of the world is that I think we are seeing a shift from a policy that really for the, since the 1970s has held, which is that of what, what diplomats call strategic ambiguity. Yes. And strategic ambiguity means that the U.S. does not push Taiwan towards independence, in fact, quite the opposite. And it never says directly that it would defend Taiwan if the Chinese were to attack it. And the Chinese have always said they, you know, they expect to have a reunification because they, they see Taiwan as a renegade province, but they've always said, always said they would prefer peaceful means. In the last couple of years, both of those factors have shifted. The Chinese see, think that the US position has shifted to being much more aggressively in favor of Taiwan's independence, which they, for them is a red line. And the US, of course, sees a much more assertive and aggressive China. And as you were describing in your intro, military, you know, military investment, military maneuvers on both sides are very extreme. I mean, the Chinese Navy is very, very powerful now. It has a huge number of ships. And, and you're seeing a logic there, which I think is very alarming. And at the same time, in Taiwan, I think there's a real question of whether, you know, whether the Taiwanese, for example, would be like the Ukrainians and be prepared to fight. So it's a, it's a real tinderbox there and really, really alarming. So the chance for misunderstanding has increased while everybody's arming. So that doesn't, uh, that doesn't bode well. But there's also a piece in the package, how to avoid a war with <laughs> Taiwan. So now that we've um, alarmed everyone, what's the case for how to pull back from this escalation? Well, I think it's, it's, it requires finding ways to, you know, find a, a little bit of that strategic ambiguity again. Yeah. Um, in, and at the same time, put in place paths to de-escalate. And this is really, you know, Taiwan is a flashpoint of a deeper, deeper distrust between the United States and China. And th this relationship, it's, it's almost become platitudinous to say it, is at its worst in decades. You know, Xi Jinping, just in the last few days, was really aggressive in his description of what the U.S. was trying to do, suppression and containment of China, he said. And he, he normally doesn't mention the U.S. by name, but he did. And here in this country, as you know, you know, the one thing that the two parties can agree on is that you have to be tough on China. And being tough means being sort of aggressively tough. And so I think there is a logic on both sides that is the dangerous one. I'm actually going next week to China for the first time since the pandemic. And I'm, I'm going to be... I'm really, really interested to see my sense is that the mood is just very, very antagonistic towards the United States. They have to develop a relationship and a way to climb down from a misunderstanding, the way the U.S. did with Russia during the Cold War. Yeah, you don't have those, you know, during the, the, that's a very good analogy because during, between the Soviet Union and the United States, in the Cold War after, I mean, there was that ter terrifying moment, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Thereafter, mechanisms were put in place to manage any, and avoid any accidental raising of tensions and to manage the relationships. And I think that's what needs to be put in place between the two. Let's switch gears because I want to get your feelings about Silicon Valley Bank and, and what's happening, both what you think is happening in 
U.S. markets, the Fed, and then overseas. I know, I know. Yeah, for one, from one dangerous thing to another. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, it's interesting this week. I, I, as you know, from when, when you and I first met, I was here in 2008 in Washington covering the, uh, the big global financial crisis. And, and of course, this is nothing like that. Let me be very clear. But I did have a sense of deja vu over the weekend when there was, you know, a sense of growing panic amongst investors and then waiting what would happen, what would happen, and a statement from, you know, the FDIC and the Treasury and the Fed on Sunday night. That was real echoes of, of, of what happened in 2008, 2009. I think what we have now is something more than just some isolated bad apples. Um, but we have, we've learned two things. Firstly, we've learned that the regulation that was put into place, the, the by and large very sensible regulation that was put in place after 2008, dealt with that problem. And that problem was really, you know, a terrible credit risk. And so banks were, you know, there were new rules on bank capital and banks had to have ample liquidity and capital. But that was in an environment, 2008, when inflate, no one really worried about inflation. In fact, deflation was the worry. And so there was much less thought about something that's in the jargon called duration risk, which is the risk that happens if interest rates suddenly rise and a bank is holding a lot of long-dated, let's say, 10-year treasuries. It has a loss on those. And so the banks in the US now have unrecognized losses, um, which means that their capital structure is just more fragile than we thought before. And it's not just Silicon Valley Bank, it's more broad. All right. Sandy Mittenbetters, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me.